Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we're back here uh, studying the book of Romans. <clears throat> we're going to be in the, our lesson text today is in the fifth chapter. Um, but before we get there, uh, I want to look at uh, the fourth chapter just a little bit. If you remember, we stopped there last week. Uh, and also, if you remember, um, I made the comment that uh, Abraham and Moses and David were three of the Old Testament saints that the Jews really revered. And we stopped last week with the first three verses, and the Apostle Paul was talking about uh, Abraham and, and his faith. And today what I would like to do is I'd like to just drop down into the, to the next section there, the next little paragraph, uh, verses 5, 6, and 7. And uh, Dave, uh, uh, Paul is going to reference David uh, here. And he's going to talk, again, he's talking about faith and faith alone. And, you know, it wasn't anything that David did but had faith. So let's just look at those first couple of verses and then we're going to move on uh, into the next paragraph. Again, just to highlight the faith. And then we'll move right on down and then we'll get to chapter 5. And I'm hoping that we can uh, continue, get through chapter 5 today uh, with the time that we have. So, you uh, know, so chapter 4, verse 5 says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And what I want to point out to you, and I know this is going to be repetitious, but it's faith plus nothing. There, there's nothing else that, it's going to, that will get you uh, into the kingdom, and, and faith is accounted for righteousness, not faith plus church membership, not faith plus uh, baptism, not faith plus anything. Um, you just put whatever you want to and fill in the blank after faith. It's faith plus nothing. And you'll see in there in verse 6 it said, Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man whom God imputes uh, righteousness apart from works. Again, I'm just referencing verse 6 because the the Apostle Paul mentions David, and, and he's in that top group of three that the Jews would revere. And, and again, I know he's talking to the whole church there at Rome, but he's primarily talking to the Jews at this point. Now, in verse 9 through 12, uh, I want to just read just a couple of those verses because another a right, uh, one of the rights that the Jews held uh, dear, and we saw that in the previous two chapters, meaning chapter 2 and chapter 3, not chapter 4, because that's where we are now. Uh, Paul, I'm going to use the word attack, and that's probably not a good word, but I'm gonna, he mentioned circumcision because that was such a, uh, uh, a sacred thing there for the Jew uh, that it was such an important thing for him. So look at verse 9. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? And there's a question mark. And usually, like I said last week, when there's a question mark, usually the answer is obvious. And the answer is obvious that it would be the uncircumcised also. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. He's just repeating what he said in the first uh, three verses of chapter 4. And then in verse 10 he says, How then was it accounted, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? And he answers the question, not while circumcised, but for uncircumcised. So Abraham had faith in the very beginning, before, before everything was given to him, before anything. It, Abraham had faith. When, when Abraham was called out from Ur of the Chaldees, all he had was faith. He didn't have anything else. And the Apostle Paul is trying to drive that point home there with his Jewish friends and his non-Jewish friends there at the Church of Rome. Come down to verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, look, but through the, right, through the righteousness of faith. And I don't know about your Bible, and I'm guessing it's going to be pretty much like mine. There's a period at the end of faith. Faith plus nothing. It was faith only. 
uh, come on down to verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Again, the faith plus nothing. It's not faith plus anything like I've already said. You can fill the blank in if you want. Uh, it's faith plus nothing. At this point, let's move on down into the lesson text today, which is starts at verse 1 of chapter 5, and it goes through uh, verse 11. And I'm just hoping that we have enough time that we can actually go into the rest of that, this uh, chapter because it's such an important chapter. And I'll go ahead and tell you to start with that from verses 12 through 21, that's the end of the chapter, that these are some hard verses, uh, probably the hardest in the book of Romans to interpret. But I'm hoping when we get there that we can walk through those verses and slow down and I hope we can get what the the Holy Spirit has given to Paul and hopefully he'll open up that up to our hearts here uh, this morning. So in verse 5, uh, the verse starts off, Therefore, having been justified by faith, again, and I know I've, I'm just saying this over and over and it's repetitious, but it's so important that it's only by faith, uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. So that's, what, five times I've already said it's uh, by faith alone. So therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace which, in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So let's start there at verse 1 and, and work through the commas, everything that's in between the commas, and that's the best way I think that we can do this. Uh, the word therefore, if, um, as you know, I've, all, I've said for many, many years now, I guess, in teaching, when you see the word therefore, what's the word therefore? And it puts us back to the previous section uh, that that the apostles been talking about. So therefore, having been justified by faith, we've talked about the justification, you know, in previous. And if you remember last week, I said that from verse from chapter one, verse eighteen, uh, through chapter three, verse twenty, that's one section. And then we picked it up last week in chapter. Uh, 21 of verse 3 and we came down through although we didn't look at all the verses we've come down through chapter 4 verse 25 that's the next section and that's the section that Paul's going to reference here uh, chapter 3 verse 21 through uh, verse 25 of chapter 4 that's the section he's talking about therefore he's re referring back to everything that's been said in that section Okay, having been justified by faith. Uh, having been justified uh, indicates a definite point in time. Having been. It's a, it's a particular time word, and it's a particular time and place that this happened to us. Uh, you know, we heard the gospel message. We, uh, we believe the gospel message. And having been, it, it has been done, okay? And it was done, and it's, we were justified by faith. Uh, like I've already said, it's not faith plus anything else. It's just faith alone. Uh, and just to go back just for a moment <clears throat> to the words having been, it also assures us of our standing before God. Having been, we, we are. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a done deal here. Uh, I think Paul uh, I think Paul here is also trying to assure us of our standing before God so we're righteous through the work of Christ on the cross it's finished uh, and so and come on down and look what it says here uh, if we've been justified by faith and look we have peace we have means that we possess it uh, if if you possess anything you, you know you can use those words that we have it we I have this or I have that so Paul says we have peace uh, and the peace that he's talking about here is naturally it's peace in our heart but it's even more than that and and we don't even think about this uh, 
many times when we were reading the scripture and thinking about the scripture. Uh, what ha- and, and it's going to he's going to really jump on uh, what I'm about to say here starting in verse 12 but the piece he's talking about here is that the war is over between the the believer and and God the Father here uh, from what happened in the Garden of Eden there was a wrath uh, because we were part of Abraham's race and so the peace that came is when we accepted we're going to see that uh, in, the, in the next little phrase there. But we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That meant the war is over between the believer and, and, uh, and God. So uh, we see there that the, when the believer comes to Christ and he accepts the terms of, uh, the, of God's forgiveness here, which is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us peace, and and the war's over between him and for us and him, and also that peace uh, also talks about that that peace is also in our hearts and minds uh, that passes all understanding. When we settle the war that was between the unbeliever and the and God, and then we become a believer, we have that peace, and we have a we have a peace that's beyond uh, our understanding. And we see we and you see there that we get it through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, look at the next section here. Through whom, that is Christ, we also have access by faith. And we see there that that access, uh, uh, by the way, the word access that we have here in verse two is uh, the in the original language that word is uh we that word is in the new testament uh three times uh it's in naturally it's here that we've just read it and it's in the ephesian letter twice and each time it's talking about the access that we have to god so you see there that uh this word uh this word also uh in 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 the jewish mindset this was this was just extraordinary for him if you think about the what had happened up until this point, uh, the only way that the Jew could get to close to God, well, he couldn't get. He he didn't have access to God at all. Uh, remember, if you have the the remember in the Old Testament, you have the tabernacle. Then you have the temple, and in the temple days, which is is where Paul is writing from, the high priest could go into the holy of holies once a year, and then. Even then, he can only go in there for just a few minutes. And so now Paul is saying here, uh, through Christ, we have access by faith. That would just blow their mind. What you mean I can have access to God through Christ? Uh, anybody can. And that mindset that they grew up with, that the high priest was the only one that could have that, this was just a phenomenal thing to them. So through whom also, that is Jesus Christ, we also have access and we have it by faith. And that again would just, that would uh, blow their mind. What you mean just by faith, just by having faith in Christ, I can have access to God. That was just unheard of. And look what it says. In that, by faith into this grace. And the grace is talking about uh, when we come to Christ and he gives us that grace, uh, and uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, in which we stand. So it's by the faith that we have gained access uh, to the grace and the love that God has for each of us. And look what he says here. Uh, in which we stand. I think that the, the, the word stand carries the idea of permanence. It carries the idea of standing firm and being immovable. I can just see the Apostle Paul's mind churning as he's looking all around the Roman Empire and there's Roman soldiers everywhere. And on the Roman soldier's shoe, there was these cleats that were on the bottom. And so when the Roman soldier is in warfare, you know, he's standing firm. Those cleats are, have dug into the ground. He's not going anywhere. So Paul is, I think, using that metaphor here 
It is we have access by faith into this grace in whom we stand, and it looks stand firm. The Roman soldier would stand firm. The Apostle Paul said, look, stand firm. And, and look what else he says. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And this this rejoice here denotes jubilation here. Uh, and he's going to use that word again in the next verse here. But he's, he's going to say something else here. And, and I'll get to that in just a second. So rejoice, that is... Uh, uh, be jubilant and in the hope of the glory of God and this hope is not to be equated in most in most of our modern day languages we have a hope it's just this little pie in the sky thing no that's not what he's talking about here uh, this this hope on the, is on the contrary is a blessed assurance of our future destiny and is based on God's love and we see that the glory of God is God's perfection. So Paul wants us to be jubilant. He wants us to rejoice in the hope that is that assurance of the perfection of God that's down the road. Uh, and God intended that for man before we fell there in the Garden of Eden. Let's move on to ver the next three verses here. <clears throat> And not only that, can you imagine there's something better than what he's already said? But he's going to say that, you know, as we move into the, to, as we move through these verses. Paul is going to say not only that, or, and even more. You know, it's just there's, there's more and more because God's so good to us. In verse 3, <clears throat> not only that, but we also, my Bible says glory. Some of your Bibles are going to say exult. Some of your Bibles are going to say rejoice. You say, wait a minute, the word's used twice. Yeah, it's used twice in these verses because the word rejoice in verse 2 and the word glory in my Bible in verse 3 is the exact same Greek word. So I've written into my Bible, and I'm going I'm to read it that way, but we also rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and then verse 5 now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us so as I've already said the the, the, the glory he's talking about uh, God's perfection that that has been poured out uh, not only that but we have that glory and look it says in tribulation and the word tribulation here uh, has the underlying meaning of being under pressure. Uh, and it was used in that day in the original language uh, of squeezing olives in order to get the oil out or squeezing grapes to get the juice out. Uh, the tribulation Paul's talking about here are not the common everyday, day-to-day -day problems that all of us face, but he's talking about the troubles that Christians suffer for the sake of the gospel. So we also glory in tribulations. And you're saying, oh my goodness, you've got to be kidding me that we're going to glory in being persecuted. We're going to be gloried and pressured uh, as we go through the life for our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but that's what he's saying here. Uh, if you remember Paul in 2 Timothy, verse 3 through 12, he tells Timothy that, listen, you know, you're going to suffer persecution. And our Lord, in, in one of the Gospels, and I don't remember which one, I didn't look it up, but if you remember, he said, you will suffer persecution. It's, it's, it, it's, it's going to happen. It's not an if, if it's going to happen, it will happen. But we also rejoice in tribulations. Uh, and look what he says here. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And the word perseverance here carries the idea of endurance. Uh, we, we're going, but we, it's going to produce an endurance uh, in, for us as we move through the Christian life. And perseverance, and tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Uh, the ability to continue working in the face of strong opposition and great obstacles. Uh, is is what what is produced there by by the word perseverance. 
And then we also, uh, what I, else I wanted to say here too, is that the gospel continue, uh, the apostle continues and says, this perseverance in turn produces proven character. And in the original language, uh, it simply means proof. And in that day, what what would happen is the uh, the a met, say a metalsmith a metalsmith would uh, uh, would heat a particular metal, gold or silver, to make sure that it's pure. And that's the that's the idea here. So it would prove its purity. And that's the that's the idea that perseverance and perseverance would produce that character that that proof that we are who we say we are and that we are uh, indeed uh, members of Christ's family. And that character would produce hope. And we've already talked about the hope is that assurance that we have that we are Christ and, and he'll see us through to the end. And look, verse 5 said, Now that hope uh, does not disappoint. Uh, the blessed assurance that our future destiny uh, is based on God's love which re which is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit and demonstrated to us in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And look what it says here. It has been poured out in our hearts. The term poured out in the original language has the idea of to overflowing. And you know, uh, when, when, the, he, when Christ pours out His love uh, in our hearts, it's poured out to overflowing. It's not just enough to get us by. It's actually poured out uh, uh, in our hearts to overflowing. And look, it comes by the way of the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Uh, just for a second, turn in your Bibles. And if uh, all our class knows that I just love these two verses, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians uh, chapter 1. And I want to read verse 13 and verse 14. Look what, the, look what the apostle says to the Ephesian church. He says, In him, talking about Christ, you also, after you heard the word of truth, uh, uh, the gospel of your salvation, where the gospel message was presented, Having believed, and like I said last week, that word believe is, is not just a casual belief. It's a trust. Uh, it's, a, it's a commitment uh, to the Lord. Look, you were sealed, by the Holy, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession through the praise of His glory? So when we believe, and and Paul's Paul's referencing Paul's talking to believers here at Rome. So when we believe, the Holy Spirit is given to us. And what else I want to say about the Holy Spirit is that this the Holy Spirit, He's the divine agent who expresses to the believer the love of God, and that's a reality of God to you and me as we as the Holy Spirit. Uh, as the Holy Spirit uh, is in, in, inside of us and is uh, in, in us because uh, He's in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We didn't have to buy the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us. Uh, one of the things that I want to share too with you too about the Holy Spirit is is that our spiritual security is not in our ability to live godly, but in the power of the Holy Spirit to make us godly. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit is the one that makes us godly and lives because He lives inside of us. Let's look at the next uh, verse there, verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, some of your Bibles may say at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, uh, so, for when that again, that is a particular point in time, and, and and it says here we were without strength, we were helpless, we were utterly helpless to bring ourselves to God. Uh, an unbeliever uh, does not have the wherefore all uh, 
to bring himself to Christ because he's spiritually dead. He's incapable of doing anything to help himself in the spiritual realm. So we see here, Paul says, for when we were still without strength, and that's where we were, were we were helpless, uh, we couldn't help ourselves in due time or at just the right time, and that's the very moment that God in eternity past had decided that Christ was going to come and hang on that cross. And if you remember when we were talking about uh, those kinds of things, uh, uh, that when we read the book of Daniel and other places, that on that Passover weekend that he hung on the cross at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that was the time that God in eternity past had determined that that Christ was going to hang on the cross. And so in the due time, or at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Th that did not come as a surprise to God. He knew exactly, and from eternity past, he had planned that particular time that Christ would come. And listen, for the ungodly, we were all ungodly at one time. We were not born saved. We had to, at one point, be saved. So we were all in that boat being ungodly at one time or, or another. Uh, while men are utterly uh, helpless to bring themselves to God, he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And even though we were ungodly and completely unworthy of his love, he does, does this to us. When we were powerless to resist Satan, and we were powerless to escape sin, we were powerless to please God in any way, he sent, our son, he sent his son to die for us. Now Paul's going to use a, a metaphor here uh, in these next couple of verses. Look at verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even to die. God's unbounding love is supremely demonstrated by Christ dying for the ungodly, for the totally unrighteous and undeserving and unlovable mankind. In the human realm, Paul is talking about here, uh, he says that for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even care to die. And, and Paul is not contrasting a righteous man and a good man here. He's just using those terms synonymously uh, because, you know, there's none of us that are righteous and none of us that are good. But he's just using the term, he's just, just using sort of a comparison here that, yeah, maybe for a righteous man, you know, maybe someone would die for that person. Maybe. Okay. But look, at, and then the next, yet yeah, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Uh, maybe if he was an, even a good person, maybe that one person would. Okay. But look what he says here in verse 8. This is the, this is the clincher here. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, the but here is a contrast from what he says in verse 7 to what he's going to say in verse 8. And we're going to see that Paul is going to contrast the human love that we saw in verse 7 to godly love in verse 8, the agape love. Look, but God demonstrates his own love toward us. Let's stop right there just for a second. The word demonstrates has the idea of continuous action. Uh, he's, it's, it's a continuous thing that God demonstrates his own love toward us. And according to our Sunday school writer, uh, commentary writer, the word that is rendered demonstrates or commendeth in the, in the authorized King James Bible or shows in the, in the English Standard Version is a compound word in the Greek and literally it means to stand together in perfect alignment. And you say, no, wait a minute, that's a bunch of Greek sure enough. What are you talking about? Look what it says here. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. God in his righteousness and God in his mercy and love and grace, uh, those two things cannot be separated. Uh, those are inseparable realities, God and his love. They're absolutely tied together, cannot be separated, and they're inseparable realities. And look what it says, that love toward us. The love he's talking about is the love toward humanity. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And look here, we were all sinners at one time. We did, we were not like I said like I said a few minutes ago, we were not born saved. We were born sinners. We were born uh, we were born rebellious against God and what God wanted to do. But during that time, while we were still sinners, while we were still outside of uh, of being saved, Christ died for us. Uh, Look at verse 9. Much more than. Can you imagine? Can you imagine any more? Uh, we've already, he's already told about the hope that we have in Christ. He's already told us about the Holy Spirit coming in when we're saved and setting up shop and helping us uh, in our day to day uh, lives as we live for Christ. And now he's, he's telling us that. Even while we were without strength, while we were unsaved, Christ died for us. Uh, and look, look at what he's even going to say. Much more than. Good gracious. He's going he's gonna to give us even more. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Uh, the much more than indicates that what Paul is about to say is even more overwhelming uh, than what he's already said in the previous verses that I've already pointed out to us. Look, having been justified by his blood refers to the initial aspect of salvation. When we first understood the gospel message and the gospel uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, sealed us that we've already talked about in Ephesians, which for believers, you know, it's a past reality, much more than having, having been justified, that thing has already taken place. Uh, uh, Paul says we are assured of being saved from the wrath to come through him that is through Christ uh, because we're now identified with Christ and are adopted as Christ's children through Christ we're no longer children of our wrath according to Ephesians 2 verse 3 <clears throat> also uh, and the pastor has mentioned this numerous times uh, in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 tells us because of what Christ did on the cross, uh, Jesus delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, he took upon himself the penalty and suffering that we deserved. Uh, and what that means as far as we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, believers will not go through one minute of the tribulation period. You, there are denominations out there that that will tell us that, you know, man, we got to do this and we got to do that, so we won't go through the tribulation period. Uh, when God saved us, He saved us from the wrath that's going to come. The wrath, the wrath that we had was before we came to Christ. After that, the wrath went away, and He saved us by His blood. Look, for much more than having been justified by His blood. Uh, you're telling me, or you know, some of the dominations are saying that Christ's blood is not adequate enough to save us from wrath. It can save us from this, or save us from that, but it can't save us from the wrath to come. Good gracious, what what kind of God do we serve that He would put His Son on the cross? Only, only the uh, well, maybe we might go through the tribulation period if the tribulation period comes through. Uh, uh Paul says that we will be saved from the wrath to come. He said, and he said that, as I've already mentioned, he has said that in three other places. Now, Paul's next thought is closer related to what he just said here in verse 9, and this is actually the central message uh, of this passage here. Look what it says here. For if when we were sinners, and all of, when we were enemies, and all of us, we're in that boat at one time before we came to Christ. Uh, we were enemies uh, to, to God. We were, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. This is, look at this next, little, the next two words. Much more than having been reconciled, we will be saved by His life. So if it couldn't get any better from what He had said even in verse 9 but he starts off verse 9 much more then and he's going to do it even here today uh, for when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son uh, 
much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life if God had the power and the will to redeem us in the first place, how much more does he have the will to keep us redeemed? And another way to say this, if God bought a, brought us to himself through the death of his son when we were enemies, how much more now, since we're his reconciled children, will he keep us saved by the life of his son? The important truth of this verse for believers is that our Savior not only delivered us from sin and its judgment, but also delivers us from the uncertainty and the doubt about that deliverance. Uh, I think that it is an affront to God, and this is just my opinion, that that there's that a person would cast doubt uh, on God's ability to keep us saved when he redeemed us to start with. You know, that person is saying to me that God doesn't have the power or his blood's not sufficient to do that. I think that's insanity. Uh, what kind of God would we serve that when the Holy Spirit comes in our lives and seals us? And by the way, uh, in that day and age, the seal would be a wax seal. And when they stamped that wax seal and formed it and put it on a document, it could not be unsealed. Uh, the, you, you can't unseal it. It will seal permanently. And you could tell if the seal had been broken, but that's not the point. The point was when that seal was made, it was made to be permanent. If you go down to the courthouse and get a document stamped and notarized, that document is stamped and notarized the way that it is, and it can't be changed. That document can't be changed. You may come up with another document, but that particular document cannot be changed. It will be the way it is until uh, the parties involved are dead or whatever. But that's, that's what we have to look at here. We shall be saved by his life. Uh, we have been reconciled. That, that can't be undone. We will be saved by his life. And, and, God, and Christ's perfect light saved us from the wrath to come. Look at verse 11. And not only that, See, if there's even more, there's even more. Can you believe that? Uh, in, verse, in verse 9, there's much more then. In verse 10, there's much more. And look at verse 11. And not only that, he's going to add some more good stuff to it. But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, don't miss this, we have received reconciliation. We possess that reconciliation. When we believe the gospel message and the Holy Spirit come in our life to set up permanent residence, he can't be expelled because uh, in for, in the, I think it's in the first letter to the Corinthians, he talks about that our spirit and the Holy Spirit join. Well, if you can take an egg and scramble it, you can't separate the yolk and the white anymore. Once you scramble that egg, it's done. And the, you know, uh, but So once the Holy Spirit comes in our life, and seals us and sets up sets up residence in our life. Our spirit and the spirit, our spirit and the Holy Spirit become integrated so together they cannot be separated. So he says here in verse eleven, not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. When we believe the gospel message, we were reconciled to God. The war is over. Uh, we possess all that he has for us to possess at that point. We got just a few more minutes and I want us to look as much as we can at this next section here. And we're going to go real slow here because it's, it's some really some hard, these are some hard verses to interpret. So let us jump in and let's start here at verse 12. Therefore, again, what's the therefore, therefore? It goes back to what he's just said actually in verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. All that good stuff that Paul has just shared with us. Therefore, just as, and, and by the way, he's going to, uh, many consider uh, these verses to be the most difficult passage in this epistle. And verses uh, 12 and 14 sort of lay the groundwork to do that in this chapter by pointing out the obvious truth that the death that death is universal to the human race and in these three verses the apostle paul is going to focus on adam and the reign of death 
that his sin brought to the human race. And then in the remainder of the chapter, verses 15 to uh, 21, he's going to focus on Christ and the reign of life that Christ brought when he died on the cross. And something else I want to point out here, and we'll see it here in verse 14, that, he, that uh, Paul brings Moses into the picture. And so we'll see that when we get there. All right, look at what it says here. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, comma, and death through sin, comma, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. As you've heard me say, and, and I've just made reference to it, the therefore connects what he's just said in those last few verses of, chapter, of, of this chapter. And just as Paul starts to compare Adam with Christ, so just as through one man, and the one man is talking about Adam, through one man centered in into the world. Now, I'm going to use a, uh, I'm going to say something here, and you got to hang on to what I'm saying here, and don't misinterpret it. Uh, sin did not begin with Adam. Uh, sin began with Satan uh, as he was thrown out of heaven, and you read about that in Ezekiel and and uh, and Isaiah. Uh, if you remember, uh, Satan wanted to be like God, and he 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 uh, he he rebelled against God and God expelled him out of heaven that was that Satan was the author of sin but what happened here but but see Adam brought sin into the world because Adam was the first human and and let me let me back up just to, uh, something else too you say well, well wait a minute uh, it was Eve that sinned and not Adam but the thing is uh, Adam was responsible for Eve <clears throat> Adam was the head of the family uh, Adam didn't have to sin, uh, but he went along with Eve. So it was Adam's responsibilities. So through the one man, that's Adam, sin entered the world. And look, when he did that, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, uh, because all men sinned. The thing is, we all, uh, we all came from Adam. So since we all came from Adam, uh, we inherited Adam's sin nature. Uh, so that's what he's talking about here. So God didn't create Adam as a mortal being that is subject to sin in the very beginning. And you see that in Genesis 1, verse 26. But God told Adam that if he disobeyed by eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that, he w it, that it would make him subject to death. And there were three kinds of three types of death that would occur there. Uh, one would be his spiritual separation from God, and then he would die physically. And then the third one actually is probably uh, tied into the first. His separation would actually involve per uh, punishment on a permanent basis here. And then death spread to all men because all sin. Uh, because of Adam's depravity, uh, the human, the whole human race was plunged into sin. Look at verse uh, 13, and we gotta, we gotta, uh, we gotta hurry up here. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And you say, oh my goodness, what in the world does that mean? Uh, think about this on the, on the human term. If there is something in our society that uh, maybe people start doing that really is destructive, okay? But they're written a law against it. Uh, since there's no law against it, a person can't be arrested for it. Now, he's still doing wrong, but he, but he can't be arrested for it. And when, since the law did not come to Moses, it's not, that, it's, not like, it's not that sin wasn't in the world. Sin was in the world, but it wasn't counted because the Ten Commandments weren't there to say, Thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not do this or that or the other. Okay, so verse 13, until the law, sin was in the world. It was here, but it was not imputed when there was no law. Okay, it, it was not... Uh, it was not imputed. That is, it, there was a period of time when there was uh, it was there was not a strict accounting for the law. Maybe that's the best way to say that. Okay, sin was here, uh, 
and everybody knew it was sin, but the law hadn't come to show us that it was sin. Okay, and if you remember, the apostle Paul said, "If it hadn't been for the law, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know that I that it was wrong to covet." But he saw that in the law. Let's move on. Nevertheless, verse fourteen, death reigned from Adam to Moses. There were, you know, people still died and all that, even though the law wasn't here. Even over those who had not sinned, according uh, to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Uh, the transgression he's talking about there is eating from the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, so even over those who had not sinned according uh, to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. See, once Adam and Eve transgressed, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. So there was, So that particular sin could never be duplicated again. So it couldn't be in the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was the type of him, and him was Christ, who was to come. Look at verse 15. Verse 15. But the free gift, that is salvation by grace, is not like the offense, and the offense was the transgression of the, of the rebellion there of Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay, but the free gift is not like the offense for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. This word many, uh, in one place, mean, excuse me, means many, and in another place it means all. Now let's walk through this, and you'll see that again in verse 18, where all in one place means all, in another place it means many. It doesn't mean all. But we'll walk through that here uh, just for a minute or two. But the free gift is talking about salvation by grace is not like the offense, that is the, the offense there in the Garden of Eden. For if by one man's offense, talking about Adam's offense, many died, that is all died. See, we, we all inherited, inherited the sin nature. And so we all died uh, spiritually because of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> all right, so all died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. See, the grace of God was much more, and it was more than enough to cover any transgression for anybody. Uh, grace through faith is, is the, the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross was more than adequate to cover any sin that would ever come up in, in all eternity or, or any time that man is on the earth. Uh, the, the grace of the one man and the, and the work of the one man, Christ Jesus, on the cross, look, it abounded to many. And, and, the, and, and it didn't abound to all, it abounded to many because all are not going to accept his grace. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, so, but the, but the grace of the one man is plenty if, if all would come to Christ. He, his death on the Christ, his blood pay, would be adequate to pay for every sin, for every human being that ever lived or ever will live. Look at verse 16. And the gift, talking about salvation by grace, is not like that which came through one who sinned. And he, again, he's referring back to the transgression there in the Garden of Eden. For the judgment which came from the one offense, that is, uh, the judgment of death uh, that came to Adam, uh, spiritual death, and also uh, what we talked about there earlier, uh, resulted in condemnation. Uh, Adam was condemned for what he did from that one offense. Look, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. God's grace is more than adequate to cover uh, many offenses. And all, those, all that covering and the free gift resulted in justification. Christ's death on the cross is more than adequate to uh, cover any offense and it would result in justification of the believer to the Lord Jesus, to, to God himself. Look at verse 6, 17. 
For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, talking about the one being Adam, for if, verse 17, for if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will, will righteousness, I can't talk, will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Again, I'm just repeating myself, I know, but, but the one man's offense which that caused death to reign through Adam, uh, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through the one Jesus Christ. That is, Christ's death on the cross uh, was more than adequate, and I know I'm just repeating myself because I'm saying it in several different ways, was more than adequate to take care of any offense and the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, it will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Uh, Christ's death on the cross was more than adequate to, do, to cover the sins of any that will come to him. We've got to hurry. We've got just a couple more minutes. Therefore, going back to what he just said here in verse 18, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, and, and all means all here because it did through one man's offense talking about Adam's transgression in the Garden of Eden resulted in condemnation that's self-explanatory even so through one man's righteousness act the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life uh, from even so through one man's righteousness righteous act that's talking about Jesus death on the cross and the redemption that came with it uh, the, then the free gift came to all men resulting in justification of life the all men there would be all that would accept and would believe the gospel message uh, the Bible nowhere nowhere in the Bible does it, does it talk about universal salvation so you always got to, when you see something like this, you've got to say, well, how does it stack up with everything that's taught from, gener from Genesis to Revelation? And we know in that realm that, you know, it's always gray through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the all here would be uh, many men. It wouldn't be all men. Verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience, talk about Adam, many were made sinners and the many here is all all were made sinners through Adam's disobedience so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous talking about what Christ did on the cross and Paul is just repetitious in what he's saying here I really think he's trying to drive these truths home but the many here will be many because all will not be righteous all will not come to Christ all will not believe in the finished work of Christ so the, the many here in verse 19 is many. Uh, the last two verses, and we'll finish up. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded even more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through, righteous, through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even though Adam brought sin into the world, and, uh, and, 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 and sin reigned in death, uh, grace was even greater. And the greater grace, uh, when it's accepted by the believer or the person that wants to be a believer, when it's accepted, uh, the grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have that eternal life. Grace would be even greater. And we're going to see that in the next uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6. That's where we're going to be uh, next week. Uh, so I hope you guys have a good Sunday and a good weekend, and we'll see you next week.